the troubled websites that let you pick insurance are run by the government. The coverage itself is sold by private insurers. The stocks of many of those companies have been rising on the prospect of potentially millions of new and profitable customers. But if people can't sign up, or if only the sickest do, the profit and loss assumptions may be seriously flawed. Joining us now to discuss is A.J. Rice. He's healthcare facilities analyst at UBS. A.J., welcome. What do the insurers fear the most, and who is most at risk among the insurers that are participating? Yeah, so I think uh, what they do fear is exactly what you're talking about, that uh, this ends up being a program where the people that have a lot of pre-existing conditions that haven't been able to get insurance sign up, and those that are healthy relatively speaking, stay on the sidelines and you don't have a balanced pool. The people that are the leaders in, in putting these plans out there right now tend to be the Blue Cross plans. Many of those are quasi nonprofit, but WellPoint, among the publicly traded companies, is one of the leaders on the exchange. In the 14 markets where they have a um, Blue Cross banner, they're out there aggressively offering product because historically the individual market and the small group market have been their strength, and that's the type of person that's ending up on these exchanges. So, AJ, uh, if people get so frustrated and they just give up and don't sign up, what's at stake besides for the insurers, for the hospitals, and also for consumers who are part of the program and may be stuck with higher prices possibly? I mean, what's at stake here? Yes. Uh, so, you know, from an investment perspective, we actually are a little more favorable uh, toward hospitals across the board because they've been the safety net for the last 25 years since the Medicaid, Medicare programs were implemented. They take on the insurance, uninsured and do not get compensated. Even if we just get the relatively sick people, the people with pre-existing conditions signing up, those are the ones that have historically shown up at the hospital and not had the ability to pay. So an HCA, a universal health services, we think that's a little bit more of a uh, cautious way to play this. We do believe that uh, for the insurers, it's going to be tough until we get clarity as to whether they'll be able to fix these glitches and whether people will be able to sign up sort of in the time frame you said. We, we think they need to have it pretty much fixed by mid-November because that's when the bulk of the signups will probably come between then and year end. I guess one of the real selling points of the Affordable Care Act was that it was going to make coverage available to uh, the very people that you're talking about, those with uh, pre-existing conditions. One of the things that has stood out to me is how few companies relatively are competing in some states like Connecticut, where, as I understand it, there are only three plans to choose from on that state's exchange, home of Aetna. And number two, why some of the biggest companies in health care insurance, like Aetna, like United Health, like Cigna, seem to be tiptoeing in here very timidly. Why? Right. That's exactly what they're afraid of. They're afraid that we're going to see a great divergence in the, in the types of people signing up and that the underwriting risk associated with those pools could be difficult. So they've chosen to focus on the markets where they have very strong presence, a lot of leverage to drive price concessions with hospitals and doctors. And so you're seeing those companies, which happen to be the ones we're recommending, be much more selective as to where they're going and what, what exchanges they're participating on. So I think, again, that's sort of a cautious way mm -hmm. to play this. All right, A.J., thank you very much for being with us and helping us out there. A.J. Rice is healthcare facilities analyst at UBS.